Oscar De La Hoya and Felix Trinidad, two warriors expecting to wage one of the great fights in welterweight history. We have two champions who are undefeated, who both have instant knockout power, who are clearly the best fighters in their division, fighting in their primes at their best weight. He has it all. He has the footwork, he has the rhythm, he has the heart, champion's heart, and he knows how to win rounds. That was very similar with uh, Muhammad Ali. And down goes Corte on a classic De La Hoya left hook. There is a sense that he cannot be beaten in his heart, and that is something that people feel and sense, and besides the fact that he looks like a supermodel. You couldn't be more motivated than Oscar and remained on Earth. If he's any more motivated, go right up in the air. De La Hoya willing to trade shot for shot with Julio Cesar Chavez. And if he performs well, I think that this is one that they'll talk about 20 years from now. If he performs poorly, people will look back at it and say, hey, you know, when he had his shot to really prove himself against Trinidad, he didn't do it. Trinidad's going to give him way more than he's got, and he's going to give it to the body, which I don't think Oscar's going to like a lot. Left hook to the body, and Pineda couldn't handle that one. If his objective is, I want to wax this guy and show that I'm the best fighter in the world, not him, then I think he goes in and says, hey, I'm bigger than you, I'm stronger than you, I'm a better puncher than you, and here, let's see if you can take what I got. And then we see maybe a short, explosive fight, maybe like a Hagler Hearns. That's why you remember the 80s and the 70s with Leonard and those names come right up, because the best guys fought the best. And people like to see these guys take a risk. They like to see them put it on the line. And that's what makes this fight a big fight. Left hand sends Hearns back against the ropes again. And that's all. It's over. And Ray Leonard is the undisputed welterweight champion of the world against the very game, Thomas Hearns. You'll have two greatest welterweights in the world, De La Hoya and Trinidad. If they come out and just fight, you'll have a great fight, and, and boxing will be bullied up by it and carried by it for a long time. It's Leonard Hearns all over. Saturday, September 18th, Oscar De La Hoya and Felix Trinidad will finally meet. Our preview show will look at both men and count down to their date with destiny. Also tonight, two live championship fights. Featherweight title holder Freddie Norwood takes on Juan Manuel Marquez, and 130-pound champ Floyd Mayweather Jr. defends his title against Carlos Herrera. Tonight, from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's HBO's Boxing After Dark. First, you'll see a special preview show looking ahead to next week's De La Hoya Trinidad Clash. Then live boxing. Featherweight champ Freddie Norwood takes on Juan Manuel Marquez. Then 130-pound champion Floyd Mayweather Jr. fights Carlos Arena. The Mandalay Bay Hotel here in Vegas may have been built with a South Pacific flavor, but in the past few weeks, it has been converted to a boxing shrine. Signs everywhere. Looking ahead to next week's De La Hoya Trinidad matchup. In fact, around every corner in Vegas. Further visual evidence of the intense excitement that surrounds the biggest non-heavyweight showdown in the sport in nearly two decades. And tonight, a live championship boxing luau to whet the boxing appetite. Good evening, I'm Jim Lampley, flanked by World Light Heavyweight Champion Roy Jones Jr. and HBO Boxing Analyst Larry Merchant as we get ready for this special edition of HBO's Boxing After Dark. Later tonight, 
two terrific prize fights. As in the first one, 126-pound battle, two-time 126-pound champion Freddie Norwood defends his title against tough challenger Juan Manuel Marquez of Mexico. And then in the second one, 130-pound world champion Floyd Mayweather Jr. defends his junior lightweight title against a durable Puerto Rican challenger, Carlos Arena. But before those two fights, a look ahead to the giant boxing event, which will take place here at the Mandalay Bay Hotel and Casino one week from tonight. The pay-per-view battle between Oscar Deloy and Felix Trinidad. And with an eye toward the magnitude of what can be called the biggest non-heavyweight fight in 18 years since Ray Leonard and Thomas Hearns faced off the first time, we want to take the next several minutes here to look ahead to the fight with you. Larry Merchant, both you and I have been impressed in recent weeks by the size of the buildup for the fight. You can't come here to Vegas without being aware that Trinidad and De La Hoya face up on September 18. What makes it so big? Let me count the ways, Jim. First, two outstanding fighters, both unbeaten, both armed with state-of-the-art weaponry, both in their primes, and the outcome could define their careers. Second, the drama is heightened because Oscar De La Hoya is a superstar who might be in serious jeopardy. And third, this showdown has been anticipated for so long, several years, that it's become an event, a bigger than boxing extravaganza. It's baked like a chocolate souffle that all of us can't wait to taste. I think I'm safe in saying on behalf of both of us, we've never seen a tougher ticket, never seen a bigger buildup in terms of the number of people who ask you and me on the streets what we expect out of this fight. Boxing fans, Roy, are eager for this to take place. And for De La Hoya, it's yet another big fight in a career filled with them. But for Felix Trinidad, it's the first time he's ever experienced an event of this magnitude. You went through it five years ago when you fought James Tony here in Las Vegas. Is there reason to question whether Felix Trinidad can handle the buildup, the atmosphere of the event. Well, yeah, there's reason to, to question it because Felix Trinidad has never seen this type of atmosphere. And this time, he's fighting the best fighter that he's ever faced. He's fighting a guy who the fans are going to be rooting for. He's fighting a guy who can do to Felix Trinidad what Felix Trinidad has been able to do to the other guys that he's faced. So it's going to be very difficult for him early. But if he can make an adjustment to this, then it may determine how well he does in the early part of the fight. Well, Delaware is certainly the better known name to the general public. But among boxing experts, there seems to be near unanimous agreement that in the months and the fights leading up to the big one, Trinidad has looked better prepared. Here's a closer look at the Puerto Rican star. In the past three decades, the relatively small island of Puerto Rico has produced a disproportionate number of great boxing champions. Now on the eve of his career-defining bout, Felix Tito Trinidad is poised to become the greatest of them all. successful amateur career. Tito Trinidad turned professional when he was just 17 years old. Three years later, he would fight for the welterweight title against Maurice Blocker. That was my first world championship fight. And I had a lot of trust in myself and my ability to perform in the boxing ring. And above all, I had a great desire to be the best and to become a great champion for Puerto Rico and my family. Trinidad was a virtual unknown, the seventh-ranked welterweight contender. But Tito pounded Blocker, and in the second round, surprisingly knocked the champion to the canvas. Suddenly, Trinidad was a world champion. When Tito beat Maurice Blocker for the welterweight championship at 20 years old, it helped to confirm the great boxer that was just awakening in Tito Trinidad. He trusted himself, and he trusted me as his trainer. And together, as a team, we were victorious. And over the next year, Trinidad's star continued to shine brightly. First, he whipped fellow Puerto Rican Hector Macho Camacho. He followed that by stopping Yori Boy Campus in a fourth-round TKO. 
and then TKO'd Ubacar in the eighth round. Trinidad was on top of the welterweight world. But as quickly as Trinidad rose to the top, he found his career fading into oblivion. The problem was a nasty financial and philosophical dispute with his promoter, Don King. Trinidad would go back to Puerto Rico and his father would be getting a lot of heat from people down there that you know, Felix should be making more money. He saw guys like De La Hoya becoming superstars and getting the kind of pay they were where Trinidad was not even a million dollar fighter. So now he begins to agitate for more money at the same time. King says, you know, look, you don't sell any tickets. Those were the most difficult years of my career because it seemed like nobody wanted to recognize me and give me credit for the great fighter that I was. I was only getting maybe one or two fights a year, if I was lucky. And that really hurt my career. We had to go to court. It hurt us financially. It seems that Mr. King did not want to recognize my talent and pay me what I was worth. In a lot of ways, it's Felix's own fault because uh, he's resisted learning English, which always will retard you. And that, more than anything else, I think really hurt him. He just, you didn't really know who he was. The public couldn't find out who he was. And so although he was knocking people out, he couldn't talk about it. He couldn't advance himself beyond his fighting, and that's just not enough anymore. One place where Trinidad's inability to speak English clearly hasn't hurt is his homeland. In Puerto Rico, Tito's the man. This is the man right here. That's the champion. Eventually, Trinidad and King settled their differences, and almost immediately, Tito got his first big-name fight in three years against former champion, Brunel Whitaker. Brunel, obey my commands at all times. This guy can hit. resounding unanimous decision over Whitaker helped propel Felix to this moment, where he now stands on the threshold of proven greatness. This is a much bigger fight for Felix Trinidad. Uh, to be the one, he has to beat someone in a super fight, and Oscar is his opponent. For Felix, he's the one that has to go back to Puerto Rico. He's either going to go back as the greatest fighter in the history of that boxing crazy island, or he's gonna go back disappointed that he couldn't beat Oscar in really the only fight in his career that really mattered. Well, Larry, with the exception of a few business battles along the way with his promoter, Trinidad's career, particularly in the ring, has seemed near perfect. Is he, in fact, that immaculate a fighter? Only the fight will give us the answer to that one, Jim. To put the question another way, the way a lot of people have been really asking it, if Trinidad seems so perfect, What's wrong with him? He does look like a perfect fighter, a fluid boxer with power in both hands and a champion's hard mentality. The supposed chink in his armor is that he's been knocked down five times, but only once in the last five years. And De La Hoya himself has been dropped four times without any accusations. Since Trinidad, like De La Hoya, has always gotten up, and since that is regarded as a high virtue in boxing, we might just find out that he is perfect. Well, of course, in the past when Trinidad has gotten up from adversity, it was often in front of his adoring home crowd in Puerto Rico. Roy, you've pointed out that this will not be a home crowd for Felix Trinidad. And in fact, in two huge fights here in Las Vegas in the past few years against Pernell Whitaker and again against Ike Quarte, De La Hoya got decisions by scoring margins which seemed way out of whack with the action in the fight. So. Is this an away game for Felix Trinidad? Oh, Jim, this is most definitely an away game for Felix Trinidad. Nobody has to make no secrets about that. I'm sure Felix Trinidad knows that. I'm sure Ike Corte should have known that coming in. I'm sure Pernell Whitaker knew that coming in. Uh, this is Oscar's home turf, basically. So when you come to Las Vegas to face Oscar, you have to come here to win exceptionally big. You can't come here to just get by or go 12 rounds and say, well, I think the fight was close enough for me to win. No, you have to come here and beat Oscar. He's the champion. He's, he's here more so than anywhere else. Therefore, you have to come to his house and beat him. So maybe Oscar does have the home court edge, but surely it's the last advantage he would want to rely on in trying to beat a fighter the caliber of Felix Trinidad. Oscar De La Hoya has a multi-layered, complicated life, but in the past, he's always been able to push his distractions aside and beat the man in front of him. Can he do it again? De La Hoya with the punishment. 
26 year old undefeated champion Oscar De La Hoya often fights as though he was born to the ring. But boxing hasn't always been in his blood. In his early childhood, his father Joel gloved him up and told him to fight against his cousin. I didn't want to fight. I was not a fighter. First punch hit me in the face, started crying. I recall my father saying, you watch, I'm gonna take my kid uh, to go train. And my father would push me every single day. You are not gonna play outside. You are gonna go to the gym. The domineering father was relentlessly critical of his son. Harsh words from an amateur loss still haunt him today. I came out of the ring thinking I lost, big deal. But my biggest critic, my father, telling me, you lost, what happened? Why didn't you work hard? Why didn't you work harder? And he did, winning amateur titles, the Goodwill Games, the Junior Olympics, and in 1992, capturing gold in Barcelona to steal America's heart. His talent and handsome features skyrocketed him to celebrity status. The Golden Boy was launched. All this Golden Boy crap, but meanwhile, Oscar's a fighter. There's a pit bull dog in there. Sugar Ray Leonard had that. Those eyes focus on the target in front of him. It's tunnel vision. But uh, I haven't seen it outside of Alberto Duran and with Oscar. I cannot look at my opponent before, so I have to look up in the sky. And once that bell rings, the adrenaline that takes over my body and my mind, and that animal instinct comes out in me, that killer instinct. Something clicks inside of him that's natural. He's eyeing the situation. It's almost like a panther, you know, it's animalistic. But there was no animal magnetism between Oscar and the Mexican fans whose support and acceptance De La Hoya struggled to win. I faced Rafael Reles. He was supposedly the challenger to beat me and dethrone me, knocked him out with no problem. I went on to face Janelle Hernandez, another dangerous opponent. I had no problem. Janelle Hernandez quits. So in his 22nd pro fight, Oscar met Mexican idol Julio Cesar Chavez. That was truly a test of, of, of macho and of, you know, who's the real man here? Who's the real Mexican? That's it. He's calling the fight. That's it. The fight That's it. is over. Now a respected champion, Oscar De La Hoya was on top. But criticism resurfaced after questionable performances against Miguel Angel Gonzalez and the evasive Pernell Whitaker. As Whitaker clowns a little bit for the crowd. I face fighters who other fighters don't want to fight. And still yet, I get criticism. It's not a matter of winning in a dramatic way. The objective uh, of being inside that ring is to win a fight. When he's had to find a punch, he's found a punch. That doesn't happen by accident. Not over and over again. That's a winner's gift. And this past February was more of the same. Facing undefeated champion Ike Quarte, De La Hoya went down in the sixth round. Here's a, a fighter who had been knocked down by a punch he didn't see coming, so he knew that Quarte was dangerous and could hurt him. So with the fight seemingly up for grabs, Oscar used the motivation that's driven him since he was a kid. You see his father jump out of his ringside seat and motion Oscar, go. Go. It, it, it's, it's panic, it's desperation. It's not cheering him on, it's demanding him on. Till this day, I think, what happens if I lose? It's always in the back of my mind. It's when it hurts all over. Oscar De La Hoya has become the idol of millions, but still he waits for praise from the one person who matters most. Hey, Dad, when are you gonna tell me that I'm doing good, that, I, that I'm fighting great? When are you gonna be happy? and show it to me. Can't wait for that moment. Oscar De La Hoya may wait forever for that moment with his father. His consolation is his willful refusal to lose has brought him every other imaginable reward and satisfaction. Larry, we've been talking for a couple of years now about Oscar's difficulties in pleasing his father. He's still winning all the fights. Do you really think it's a negative or could it be seen as a positive for him? It sure works so far, Jim. For some athletes, the fear of losing is the most powerful motivator. And when you mix that with an equally powerful desire to win, which De La Hoya also has, it's a very potent force. Additionally, De La Hoya sees himself transcending boxing. He wants to be not only a great fighter, but a great man, musing aloud about becoming an architect, an actor, a singer, a golfer, whatever. So how much fire would he walk through to get to his promised land? 
good question. And that great man ambition provides Roy an interesting contrast to Trinidad because it's clear when you talk to Felix and his people that they see this as the career defining fight. Their goal is to beat Oscar De La Hoya. Oscar's always played on a bigger playing field than that. And he knows that even if he loses this fight, he still has his image and his marketing power. Is that another advantage for De La Hoya? Yes, I think it is, Jim, mainly because even if he starts to fall behind in the fight, he has an image to uphold. So for Oscar, there's not a lot of pressure because he can come back, he can get a rematch for this fight because Tito's menu is just not quite as big as his is. He can go to other fighters. He has so many things he can do. I think it's better for him. Tito wants to concentrate on winning just this particular fight, which would make it a little more narrow-minded. All right, and perhaps a little bit more of a desperate situation for Trinidad if he falls behind in the fight. Plenty of keen insight there into what the fighters might be thinking and feeling when they come into the ring. Now, what will they do? Which strategies and techniques must they employ as they try to find ways to beat each other? This is a fascinating fight in terms of strategy because you can't be sure how it's going to play out. There are two scenarios. You could very easily have a fight where two guys are very cautious, very afraid of one another. And it becomes a very sort of boring tactical chess match. The other one is bombs away, two knockout punchers, maybe both of them hitting the floor. In fact, Oscar De La Hoya has tasted the canvas four times, while for Felix Trinidad, the number is five. When I step inside that ring, September 18th, I will be so scared of Felix Trinidad. I will use that against him because I want to feel scared. I want to feel nervous. I'm not going to get hit by one of Felix Trinidad's punches. Too sharp, too quick, too powerful a punch. I see Trinidad as a very confident fighter right now. I will not be intimidated by anyone. Okay. He's pretty consistent with his style. The jab, counter punches, two hands, great combination puncher, wastes very little energy, wastes very few punches. I would see that he's probably gonna try to push on De La Hoya offensively, try to be the boss. Sometimes he gets greedy as an offensive fighter, and he stays there a little too long. And if you stay for one punch too many, you can be picking yourself up off the floor. And on the other side of the coin, you have De La Hoya. Vasco has been successful in his last few fights with the counter opportunities. And down goes Corte on a classic De La Hoya left hook. His step back in a defensive manner and then he'll throw a left hook. He'll set it up off the jab and then when you walk in he lets you think it's okay to walk in and he'll counter the hook. Now he'll do it in a conventional way up here, but he'll also do it in not such a conventional way. He'll have it down here like he did to Oba Car. Another left hand by De La Hoya and down goes Car again. Mm. Those last three rounds, which we call the championship rounds, I'm gonna go out there and become a real champion. Oscar's brave. Oscar De La Hoya is a brave man. What exactly will happen on fight night? Anyone's guess. But the consensus is that two great fighters will put on a memorable show. What you'll see is Trinidad come out early and really try to uh, do some damage in the second, third, and fourth rounds. If Oscar tries to come forward and establish the fight, Trinidad will make war with him. That's probably to Oscar's advantage. He's been there before, and he has a tremendous will to win. So if, if it gets to be that, I give Oscar the edge. A pure boxing match, I actually give Trinidad the edge. However it ends will be with TNT. Well, just to cite one graphic example, Roy Jones Jr. very easily outboxed James Tony in their confrontation here five years ago. And some boxing experts will tell you below the heavyweight division, almost all mega fights like this one are won by the superior boxer. So, Larry, will Oscar De La Hoya box, 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 as he says in that feature piece that he will? Jim, if a cow says it's going to bark, I'll go out on the limb and predict that it's really going to move. It seems safe to assume that Oscar De La Hoya will fight Felix Trinidad the way he's fought in other big fights. Try to establish dominance early, go through a few periods of tactical withdrawal, and then close the show like a champion, which parallels how the great Sugar Ray Leonard, though a much smoother mover than De La Hoya, fought Tommy Hearns in their memorable epic. Uh, avoid Hearns' power, choose to engage him on his own terms, and then Turn out the lights, the party's about to be over. De La Hoya's seemingly incoherent walkabouts serve a similar tactical purpose. He can't figure out just what he's doing, he's not scoring points, but then it leads up always 
to this kind of explosive finish. De La Hoya wants to win so badly that at times he's willing to look bad to do it. And that's a versatility that Trinidad hasn't shown, mostly because he hasn't had to yet. Jim. Well, very good point. Felix Trinidad has been totally in control probably 90% of the time in all of the fights throughout his career. And he's never really been backed up on the defensive, dominated for any period of time in a fight, Roy Jones. So what happens against Oscar De La Hoya if in the early to middle rounds Felix Trinidad doesn't get his way? What will he do to try to reverse that? Well, Jim, that's why we have a big fight coming up on the, uh, the, night, the 18th, because we don't know what he'll do in that situation. However, we think that since Felix Trinidad has been champion for so long, and since he seems to show every good attribute of a great champion, we think that he'll be able to make an adjustment if he does fall behind. However, if he can't make that adjustment, then it'll be a quick night for him. 18 years ago, Thomas Hearns was more the unknown quantity, and to the astonishment of ringside, he outboxed Ray Leonard for many rounds in the fight and thus was ahead on the scorecards. Oh, if this one can only live up to the dramatics of its historical predecessor, ebb and flow, shifting tides of fortune, and then the dramatic twist at the end, partially stimulated by a legendary trainer. We are down to round one, and here we go. There may never be another welterweight championship fight that will equal the drama and excitement that was generated between Sugar Ray Leonard and Thomas Hearns. Everybody wanted to see the fight. Half believe Hearns, half believe Ray Leonard. Perfect promotion. They had these two great American gladiators that were couldn't have been more obviously the all-American boy against the Motor City Cope. They had met. It was one of the most anticipated fights in the history of boxing, not just from fight fans, but from the general public. It was an event. It was big, huge. September 16, 1981. It was called The Showdown, billed as the fight of the century. Sugar Ray Leonard and Thomas Hearns. And like Delaware and Trinidad, it featured two young champions in their prime. They met in a celebrity-filled stadium on the steamy tennis courts of Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. It would be the largest grossing sports event to that point in history. Lou Rawls singing the national anthem. John McEnroe, you had Bill Cosby, Wayne Newton, Dean Martin, Muhammad Ali, of course. Wherever you were, people were watching this fight. If they weren't watching it, they were waiting for the result. Every movie theater in your neighborhood had it, and they were all filled. I was rooting for Tommy, and so were most of the people in that theater. Because a lot of people felt about Ray Leonard the way some people feel about Oscar De La Hoya right now. How could a guy that's that good looking be a good fighter? He can't really be a man. They must be set ups. So everybody wanted Tommy Hearns to knock him out. The casting called for Hearns' power against Leonard's speed. And for the first five rounds, Hearns took control. My first thought was, you got him hurt, get him out of there. Get him out of there, don't let him go another round. And I tried to do everything I possibly can to get Ray out of there. And the round four. So far, as you mentioned, it's living up to its billing. In the sixth round, on a flash exchange, Ray landed a beautiful left hook. I came down with the same left hook to the body, and he buckled. But I could never really land enough punches or deliver a number of combinations to end it once and for all. The Leonard onslaught continued in round seven, as Hearns did everything he could to survive. Here we come to the end of the round. Hearns is staggering away from the corner. He's Went back to the corner, and I said, I have to change things up. So we decided to start giving Ray angles. And that really threw him off. He didn't know how to deal with that. Suddenly, it was Tommy Hearns jabbing and moving, jabbing and moving. And he was out boxing Sugar Ray Lane. And you sat there sort of with your mouths agape, so say, this is impossible. That first right hand wasn't very hard. The second one, he goes it up on his head. And once more, Thomas Hearns. About the 12th round. Uh, Thomas had the crowd even cheering to the point where it was like a guaranteed victory. I had to jump on him and tell him, hey, you're blowing it now, son. You're blowing it. You're fighting this guy's fight. That's a no-no. You gotta be quicker. You gotta take it away now. Okay? Speed! He hit the button. Hit that magic button that started me to throw more punches. And he does it with one eye closed. I mean, you can't really dream up a more dramatic scenario. You know, everybody thought this other guy was going to knock him out. And, you know, who's the guy draped over the ropes right now? He picked up the momentum again, and Hurts couldn't deal with it. 
and that momentum continued into the 14th round. Behind on all three scorecards, a half-blind Leonard dug even deeper. Hearns just trying to hang on here. Left hand sends Hearns back against the ropes again. And that's all. It's over. And Ray Leonard is... You knew they were great fighters. And when the fight was over, you knew that both of them were all time great fighters. Even the people that wanted the loser to win were like, hey, you know, we just saw a hell of a fight. Only one guy wins, one guy loses. The better man wins. The better man that night was Ray Leonard. Well, Larry, the parallels between De La Hoya Trinidad and Leonard Hearns Juan are so obvious that no one can resist the comparison. Is it a fair one? See, si, a Latino version of same. And a cultural milestone as well. The first mega fight between Latinos in the U.S., an event as significant in its own way as the assimilation of Latino music, food, and politics. Muy importante and mucho dinero. Muy bueno y verdad. And Roy, guys like you who've been hanging out in boxing gyms have no doubt been trading observations and predictions about this fight for years. As we get to this stage a few days away, what do you find yourself most looking forward to about Trinidad de la Hoya? Well, I think I'm mostly looking forward to how well Felix Trinidad can adjust to Oscar de la Hoya's punching power early in the fight. Secondly, I want to know who's the better technician of the two, which guy can go out and make the other guy do exactly what he wants that guy to do. Thirdly, if we're there that long, I want to find out who has the bigger heart. All of them open questions in your mind. All of them are wide open, which is why we have a fight set for September 18th. And won't it be fun if we get all of those questions answered through the course of the bout? Final thoughts, Larry? Now, Jim, there's an old blues song with a lyric that goes, he's got hot chilies in his brain and ice water in his veins. And that applies to the two wonderful fighters we've been celebrating tonight. And the one who calmly and intelligently can raise or lower the temperature of the action will win. As referee Mills Lane would urge us, let's get it on. Indeed. <laughs> and we will get it on on the evening of Saturday, September 18, live from the Mandalay Bay Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada, and live in your home via TVKO pay-per-view, the two unbeaten welterweight champions against each other, Oscar De La Hoya and Felix Trinidad at long last.